I think that an entrepreneur, if they start building stuff, then they start making the thing that they built. They're trying to basically, they've built their hammer and now they're just going to search for a nail, right? They built a solution and they haven't really understood what the problem is they're going after deeply enough. And I've just seen so many entrepreneurs spend years of their life building something and being stuck with it and then trying to figure out how to fit it into something that it doesn't work. Hi, I'm Jubin, operating partner at Kleiner Perkins, and I'm excited that you're tuning into Grit. The goal of this is not for it to be a highlight reel of how successful my guests are, rather a candid exploration of how hard it is, both personally and professionally, to create, build, and scale world-class organizations. If you're a fan of the show, please subscribe, leave a review, and make sure to follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter. Thanks. Does it feel weird being here in LA? You drive down the street coming up here, it's like palm trees, there's space. I spent um, 15 years living in New York and had a phenomenal time in New York. I think the energy is incredible in New York. But one of the things I, I like about LA is you can still get a lot of the access to great people, great energy, entertainment, all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, you can also drive five, 10 minutes away from that and have a yard and have space. Whereas in New York, that's just not possible. In New York, the best you can do is, you know, you can take a 45 minute commute to Brooklyn, but you're still living in a, some sort of building, brownstone, whatever, or you can go an hour plus to a suburb and maybe get some more space. I just love how you can kind of balance those things more in LA. You built company number two, Attentive, in New York, if I'm not mistaken. It's like one of the canonical New York City companies. Doing it all over again, would you do it in LA? I think that for that business and what we did in New York was the right place for it. But we certainly had, and I I think today it's something like of our top 100 customers or something, LA is often the number one or number two DMA for where they're located. So tremendous amount of companies in LA that were top customers for us. But that being said, I think that starting a company really hard, doing that in New York, a place that I had built before, knew well, made it easier to operate out of New York again. That makes sense. Well, I appreciate you welcoming me into the home. When I was driving over here, one of the thoughts that I couldn't shake was... I did a bunch of homework on you. You started company number one and sold it to Twitter, started Attentive, raised eight rounds, almost a billion dollars, last valued at six and a half billion. It will go public at some point. It will be amazing. How old are you? I am 39. Hey, young as hell. I was trying to get in your head of, okay, Jubin, you're going to this guy's house and is he bored? Is he antsy? Is the pressure of having run Attentive for seven years, and again, you're the executive chairman on the board, I understand that, but as the CEO having stepped away, are you relieved? What's the honest feeling that you have? It's been six months, not even, having stepped away. I just, I was trying to get myself in your head, like, how do you feel? I feel great is the short answer. The longer answer is that I love building things. I love operating and building companies. And I also have a yearning to go after bold and audacious company ideas. When I was kind of coming up in tech and entrepreneurship, I remember actually distinctly when I had sold the first company to Twitter, and I was already thinking about the next company and how I was going to do something and and try to do something even bigger and, and more interesting. And I remember I talked to this other CEO who had sold his company to Twitter too. And he was like, oh no, I'm, I could never do another company. I'm just going to, you know, go become a VC and, and, you know, invest in other people's companies. I could just never see myself doing that. I love the part of zero to one building and scaling and operating the business and working on the business and being just really, really deep into it. Do you love the zero to one? literally the finding product market fit? Most people wouldn't say they do. Yes, I would say that that's the most fun part of the process because it's the hardest part. And it's also where the most value is created. And I think that you can't outsource that. I don't think either. Whereas like 
when you're in scale mode around certain things, there's a playbook and there's a lot of stuff that you can delegate and outsource, but you can't delegate and outsource zero to one. You just can't. And to me, that's what makes it really exciting and fun to go do. You could take the, let's just say Dave McJanet, HashiCorp CEO path of not Bill McDermott, where you're inheriting a billion dollar revenue business, but Dave McJanet taking a million ARR business and founders don't want to do it, but not that interesting either. I think this is a unique view that you have. Yeah. There are obviously cases where you might have an early product and you want to kind of squeeze that into where you see a market opportunity and maybe there's IP there that's valuable that you want to reposition. But to me, that's almost like a refounding of the company again. I don't know who the person is you mentioned that had a million dollars, but I think that taking it from that early part and having the team walk away and even take it from that very early stage onward and finding that fit at a million where they were, I'm not sure they had product market fit at that point. So a lot of work to do. It comes back to this definition of what is product market fit and when is it actually working? When can it really take off versus when is it more, hey, they're, you're operating something and it's kind of on more of a, a seeable path. I probably wouldn't draw that line at a million dollars. Where would you draw it? And by the way, I think it's drawn differently for different companies. The reason that typically I think companies draw it at a million is because generally that's where venture capitalists are calling their shot. And I think the reason that venture capitalists want to do that is because they need some clean delineation that is a ARR that then they can say, all right, from this point, how quickly are you growing? And then be able to catalog that versus other best in class SaaS companies. I think the reason a lot of companies get in trouble at somewhere between five and 20 million in ARR and kind of blow up is that they mistook product market fit to be there at a million dollars. I think maybe a definition greater to of market is needed. What I think a lot of entrepreneurs will do is they'll try to set the TAM for their market and they'll say, oh, I have this enormous TAM, right? But in reality, the problem that they're solving for their customer, their initial low-hanging fruit customer, is only a small subset of that TAM. And quickly, their product grows and does really well in that small subset. And that's when all the numbers look great and everything looks great. And, you know, you put in all the models and you say, oh, my God, this company is going to grow to the roof. But the reality of the situation is that the company does not actually have a solution that works for this enormous TAM. It only works for a subsegment of the market. And a lot of companies, I think, run into big problems at, you know, let's call it again, between say five and 20 million something ARR because they mistake their product working for this massive TAM when it's only a small subset. If you were that founder, how do you combat that? I think that you need to have more widespread customer exploration and conversations earlier on than many companies do. In particular, you know, with Attentive, we had four inside salespeople from really two months after founding. Some of the first people we hired were four inside salespeople. And their job was to just set up tremendous amounts of meetings for myself and one of the other guys to go out and sell our product far before we had it. And we had hundreds and hundreds of meetings that we were able to go out and understand the market and really understand what parts of the market growth opportunities existed in. Instead of just kind of relying on the typical, I'll get a couple friend intros, I'm going to get a couple sales meetings and go from there. But, and it's funny because I was just having this conversation this morning, but doesn't that go against the face of conventional wisdom, which says, hey, go solve a problem that you have felt, meaning when the Okta founders were at Salesforce and they felt this problem. And that is actually the most defined and common narrative, maybe second to, which I think you also don't fit, the CEO coding, being very hands-on keyboard engineer. Neither of those I don't think are you, but I guess the reason that people don't have the level of seemingly deliberateness that you do in sizing up the markets and stuff is because 
in their mind, it's if I don't solve this problem, nobody is. I know this problem better than everybody. Thus, I should go solve it. And so therefore, you lose a little bit of the mindfulness in your approach because you're working backwards from the problem that you felt. I think your first point is, should companies only be built to solve problems that the builder, they themselves have? And my answer to that would be a firm no. This is probably a reason why there's far too many developer tools companies and not enough companies trying to figure out how we're going to solve you know, our water crisis in the United States in the next 20 years or whatever it is, right? The bigger problems in the market, they take more time and are harder to learn about. To gain the understanding of a problem that maybe you're not experiencing yourself in your everyday life, it's harder, certainly, to understand that. But I think if you're an entrepreneur, and look, because it's harder, I think a lot of entrepreneurs pick an easier path of solving a problem that they themselves feel acutely. But there's a lot of problems out there to be solved that maybe they themselves aren't feeling. Number two, I think maybe this is a little bit of a bolder statement, but there's some advice that's commonly given, I think, to entrepreneurs who like, just start building stuff, just start writing software, just start building stuff. And I think that's really dangerous advice and can be one of the top reasons why it'll lead to years of misery for an entrepreneur. I think that an entrepreneur, if they start building stuff, then they start making the thing that they built. They're trying to basically, they've built their hammer and now they're just going to search for a nail, right? They built a solution and they haven't really understood what the problem is they're going after deeply enough. And I've just seen so many entrepreneurs spend years of their life building something and being stuck with it and then trying to figure out how to fit it into something that it doesn't work. On the other hand, I'd say build last. I think that you want to deeply understand your market, what the problem is, everything that's going on, have a clear thesis, and then go build. That's not to say you're not going to go pivot down the road in different directions based on what you learn once you build a product. I'm not taking that iterative step out of the process, but I think people don't do enough discovery because it's much more satisfying for most people to just start building something. Do you think that the zero to one and maybe the satisfaction of going and building the thing that they know well, do you think the reason that that's so hard for people, do you think it's because of this insecurity that it is so existential at the early days that people can't enjoy that part of it because you're the closest to dying at that point? I think that this is an element of the existing venture ecosystem that's kind of broken, that forces an entrepreneur to commit very early on to something so that they can get some money, so that they can employ people. And then they kind of feel like they have to do work on that thing they committed to because they don't want to feel like they're scamming someone by immediately going in another direction. But they'll often find in the first few months very clear signs that what they're doing is not a great idea. And yet they just keep plugging along. So I think that the process instead should be a much bigger focus on discovery. You don't feel like you're making progress if you aren't building something at times, but really you should feel great about the progress and things you're learning and doing discovery. And I think that's underappreciated in the process. Do you think the qualities of a great entrepreneur are similar to the qualities of a great startup employee? Yes. I think that when hiring great startup employees, I'm often pulled to people who have their own future entrepreneurial goals for themselves. Let's imagine that Brian Long's palm tree venture studio firm existed. Okay. I don't know. I just made something up because they're in LA. If it's not necessarily the engineer, if it's not necessarily the person that has a problem, what qualities would you look for when investing in an entrepreneur? First off, I'd say in all the investments I've made. Which is how many roughly? I don't know, like 100, something like that. The ones that have done well were the cases when I didn't really understand the market or the product, but I knew the person who was the entrepreneur and had a lot of confidence in their abilities to succeed. And overwhelmingly, the biggest zeros were ones where it seemed like a really cool hop market to be in, but I didn't take the time to get to know and understand what was driving the entrepreneur and the team behind it and what their plan was. And certainly, I think understanding that co-founding component, what makes up the team, what drives them, what they're interested in, what their culture is, you know, what they're doing for, that sort of stuff has a big impact in who I would select and not. 
Can we go a layer further into that? Like, what are you looking for in those things? I think it's often people with something to prove people that actually enjoy working and building things. For me, one of the most important things is speed. So being able to meet with someone and then a month later, you catch up again and you kind of say, hey, what's happened in the last month? You can quickly tell the difference between people that just kind of get shit done versus people who get pulled into 30 different things and don't focus and don't get stuff done. There's an incredible pace that I think I've found with people who have been most successful that just always put one foot after the other. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to them a month apart, they're like, oh, in the last month, I did all this stuff. And you can see it, the energy and what they recall. And that's really what it all comes down to is putting one foot ahead of the other and just constantly getting stuff done. When you sold Tap Commerce, it was a pretty quick acquisition by Twitter, wasn't it? A couple of years? Yeah, we started it in June of 2012 and sold it to Twitter in June, July 2014. So it was about two years beginning to end. A uh, hundred million? Was that the number? Yeah, the, the, the number before the time is around 100 million, yeah. Which is, at the time, that's a, that was a big outcome. At the time, that was a great deal. That was just an incredible deal. Now it, it sounds de minimis. But also, how big was your team at that point? It was a relatively small team. It was only like 30-something people. That's what I mean. So it was a good win. Yeah. And we were doing about $2 million a month in revenue at the time. So we had a real enough business. There was definitely some customer concentration, but we had a real enough business that it wasn't crazy that it was selling for that amount of money. You were in sales before then. That's right. Were you good at sales? I went to school in Philly and I knew I wanted to get into tech entrepreneurship. It was funny, actually. I, when I was at school, I had a meeting with Josh Coleman, who runs First Round. And he had tried to get me to go work at LinkedIn as like an intern or something. I guess it had just started at the time. And, you know, I started about, thought about working for one of those companies, but I ended up having two opportunities. One was to either work in consulting which was the thing a lot of people from school went to go do, potentially for tech companies, or two, to work at a tech company, CNET.com, which was at that time its own independent mm -hmm. public company, but still a relatively small business. And I went and I talked to one of my friend's fathers, who was probably the most successful business person that I knew. And I said, what should I do? And he goes, whatever you do, get a job in sales in the general area that you want to work in, in tech. Because if you work in sales, you will understand the entire business. You'll understand what drives the business. And you'll also learn a skill that will be important for you as an entrepreneur and whatever you do. And that was one of the best pieces of advice that I got in my career because most people coming out of my school would not take a sales job. And I was probably the only person I knew who was working at a job in sales. This is uh, at Penn? At, or at Penn, yeah. 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 So most of my friends were working people going to work in investment banks or going to work at some private equity firm or whatever it was. And I'm going in sales to go work at a tech company. It was very weird at the time. And also startups were not cool. Yeah. No one was recruiting for tech or startups out of school at that time. So it was a weird thing. And I was very lucky because when I, I got into it, I really learned sales doing it myself for several years and deeply understood that process pretty, you know, over the course of several years. And at first I thought I was good. You know, your question was, were you good? I thought I was good. And then I went from a well-known brand to a brand new startup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I quickly found out I was not good. Selling stuff at a well-known brand is like serving the counter at McDonald's. It's like you want fries with that. Sales as a startup is very different. You're the guy out front of McDonald's trying to get someone to give you money. Like it's a totally different game. And I think that that was a very humbling process to go do one of the first salespeople at a startup. And then actually that's where I got good at sales was needing to do day one startup sales and just trying to get things on the ground. I don't actually know why I asked if you were good at sales. I have no idea. That's a pretty tough question. It's different types of sales would be the answer. I think that there are certain things that I'm good at, and there are other things that I know other people are much better at than me. Like, for instance, I think on the relationship sales side, particularly selling to certain types of customers, I'm not the best at. I'm not the person who you're going to send to a happy hour and they're like, going to make friends with everyone there. I'm not as uh, extroverted to be that guy to do that. But if you want someone to go meet with executives, C-level executives at a big company and like really present something and sell to them, I'm good at that part. Yeah. Instill confidence in what 
you're doing to them. Yeah, I think I can connect with that audience because a lot of sales is connecting with your audience and doing it in you know an authentic and interesting way. And and I, and again, when people ask me my favorite business book. I always say that How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. If you haven't read that book, you have to read that book in business. It's right about people. It was written in like the 40s or something or the 50s, but it's still everything in that book is like how people are. Yeah, it's the book that my dad has told me to read since I was a little kid. What stands out to you about that book? Because I've heard you talk about that book several times. Like it actually has a place in your heart. The name of the book is very cynical to a degree, but If you read the book, you understand it's really not a cynical book. It's about how do you build connections with people so that you can understand each other for your mutual benefit. And to me, some of the things that just stand out to people, some things that I'd also borrow from someone else you've interviewed on on your show, uh, Matt Mochari, my exec coach, is just the importance of having people feel heard and genuinely listening to people. Mm-hmm. Something he does is when you'll say something, he'll kind of show you that he was listening by repeating it back to them and then giving his answer. That's been one of the most effective things I've seen in my entire career because so often people are just not accustomed to actually being listened to. Yeah. And when you realize that someone's actually listening, you're much more interested. Yeah. Isn't one of the other things about people's names? Yes. I subscribe to that deeply. Repeating the person's name saying, hey, you know, it's about you, I'm, I'm going to talk about you, et cetera, is like incredible. I had a guy who I've talked about on the show before called Tom Mendoza. Do you know who Tom is? He was the president of NetApp. And he joined NetApp at like maybe a million of ARR, maybe a million. He gave a speech to one of the first president's clubs at NetApp. There was about 100 people there. And he stood on stage and he started by thanking every person by name, significant other, you know, the person working there in their plus one. He spent hours the night before doing flashcards with his wife just to remember their names. It's almost like that, but maybe just more broadly, a lot of the things that you would read in How to Win Friends and Influence People. By the way, the other book that my dad has always told me to read is Think and Grow Rich, but it's like a dying art. It's a dying breed of really good advice that people, I don't know why people don't do it anymore, but it's always stuck with me, that story. Well, I think that technology has enabled us to be a more transactional culture. And therefore, maybe it's diminished some of the relationship building mechanics. But I wouldn't bet against, in the medium to long term, the power of relationship building. And I think particularly in startups, you know, you write a check to someone for an early stage company, they can do whatever they want with that money. Like that money can go anywhere. And it really is a pure trust thing. Like you are trusting the person. Hey, here's $2 million. That person could just be like, hey, that sounds great. I'm never going to hire anyone and I'm going to be off in some other country. See you never. There's really no recourse to stop that from happening. So it's an incredible amount of trust. And I think that's why relationships play a much bigger part than maybe we give them credit for. In a world created where we talked about LinkedIn earlier, where LinkedIn allows people to move their jobs so easily and all work seems more transactional and in a lot of these remote first companies, work has become more transactional. You do lose some appreciation for the importance of relationship building. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. After you sell Tap Commerce, what happened? The day that we sold, I was really happy. How happy? Very, very happy. Like rich money that you probably didn't expect. Your team was taken care of. Yeah, I think the feeling of, hey, you know, I always wanted to be a successful tech entrepreneur, you know, sell the company, make a bunch of money for me and my friends, you know, all that sort of stuff. And on day one, when that happened, that's how I felt. I woke up the next day and maybe this happened in the next couple of days. There were two things that stuck with me. One was that no one cared. So I think that while doing it, you kind of think, oh, I'm going to do this. And people are then going to realize, hey, Brian's great. He did this, whatever. And then I just quickly realized, like, actually, no one cared at all that I did this. Like, my parents were were happy and, you know, maybe some of your closest friends. But, like, most people don't care at all. And I think that there is tremendous freedom in realizing that. But I also think that that drives a lot of people to do things they don't want to do. So, A, I think realizing no one cared was part one. And then part two was 
once you get beyond that, you're like, well, what do I want to be doing with my day-to-day life? And I quickly realized like, hey, the most fun I had was actually in the building of this company, (laughs) taking this company from zero to one, making it work, working in a team with a bunch of folks, just trying to kind of pull things together, create a lot of value for all of our customers, build something new people hadn't done before. Like that was the fun part. Mm -hmm. And I just quickly realized I wanted to get back to doing that again. So you go from elation to, damn it, this is not what it was supposed to feel like, to Elation again, starting another company. This is round two after Twitter, after you hung out of Twitter for a couple of years. Did you start to feel like, did reality set in? Like, oh shit, am I? I also think that ego is a bad thing and a dangerous thing. One of my regrets is that I didn't make more connections and friends and get more done when I was at Twitter. And you know, a viewpoint I probably had at the time was like, hey, you know, I'm some hotshot who built this company and sold it. I'm great. And I think that getting away from that and also realizing the like nobody cares and sort of lack of self-importance has helped a lot in doing more companies and approaching them for the right reasons. But I think that for doing our second company in 2016, it was elation again. It was excitement in like getting back to startups And hey, we're going to go do the startup again. And this is so much fun. And, you know, we're going to get to do our thing. And then after like six months, it was a pretty abject failure. Like we had. This is attentive. Yeah. My co friend and I, who had started Tap Commerce together, we started Attentive together. And, you know, we had written a check for a bunch of our money to start it. And we had taken a little bit of outside money too. But it was, we had each written big checks ourselves. And we put our money in. And after about. I don't know, it was like six to nine months. We had spent about half of our money. (laughs) And we looked up and we were like, we spent half our money. We did not like what the company was doing. It was not working, really. And we were just kind of sitting there like, were we just really lucky last time? (laughs) Like, like are we we not? Yeah, like the imposter syndrome started creeping in. Yeah, I think it hits you hard and uh, you think, were you just lucky? Are we not going to have this again? And I think that that mindset can hit you pretty hard at that point. But I think it also kind of gave us the strength to say, you know what, this thing's not working, but screw it. We'll figure it out. Let's do something else. And we change speeds and change the company name and turn that into a tenant. It has to be exacerbated with the expectations that you feel, meaning probably before Tap Commerce, you were beg borrowing and stealing to raise any money. Right. Now, I bet once you're coming out of Twitter, you're telling me Brian Koppelman and every other VC wasn't knocking down your door? With Tap Commerce, I remember I met with 52 investors to raise our first round, and we got like a couple yeses. We raised $1.2 million. Whereas with Attentive, we didn't have to meet with anyone. We just knew the people who we'd worked with before and said, hey, we're doing something new. And they said, great, we'd love to put in. So it was a million times easier. And you know, it's funny when you recruit people too, recruiting was very hard for the first company. People did not want to take that risk. Hey, I'm going to go work for these people who have never really had a success before, try to make it work. I don't know. It's so much easier to recruit people when you've had a prior success. They think you've got it figured out. Of course, you don't. <laughs> you, you know, you may have it less figured out than the last one, but they did have this feeling that you had it figured out. And I think the team struggled a little bit when it wasn't working for the first, you know, six, nine months. And then we said, hey, we're going to completely pivot the company. And there were a few people who were like, hey, Brian and Andrew, they don't really have this figured out. So I think that was an interesting experience, but we're happy and, and lucky they stayed with us. And when you hear those comments, does that really hit deep? Because you're like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, it probably did. Going through the process again now, today, because we're doing a bunch of zero to one work, working on new companies, and it's a reminder of how hard it can look like it is to be successful in a thing when you're starting it. It can feel like, oh, there's all this competition in this direction. Oh, it's impossible to build X direction. Hearing all sorts of experts give you the wrong advice. And you just have to remember those experiences and know when to push through. And I think going back to your point of they think you have it all figured out, like the employees, the talent that joins you the second time. I wonder if maybe it's just that they know that you've seen this story before. And so your level of resilience through some of 
the inevitable adversity that comes your way is probably just higher than most because you, you know, you just have this quiet confidence about you that I am the only one that's going to figure this thing out because no one else is really going to help me in most cases, even not even customers. I think it takes a lot of help from others, but I think you're right on resilience in that I wish I'd given that as an answer when you asked about what you look for an entrepreneur. You know, it's that constant speed, getting the stuff done and a resilience to kind of push through a problem and just find a way to get around it. I'm inherently a big optimist and I get energy from other people that are somewhere between optimist and realist. I can't stand pessimists, people that are just seeing all the issues and all the problems and all the reasons not to do things. They, I think, can stop you from doing anything. I think that it's very difficult to test resilience. And so I think that you can look back at someone's life, personal or professional, understand their story, and see where that coat of armor may or may not have come from. And I think, again, going back to the Silicon Valley advice, one of them is that second-time founders are better. But really, I think what they're trying to say, whoever they is, is that it's an easy litmus test for the fact that they have gone zero to one, know what it is, and want to go do it again. Therefore, like relatively good equation towards resilience. Yeah, I mean, I'd say two things. One is you're right that you have that check mark for resilience. But two to me is what are the most essential pieces of the job for being a CEO? I think number one is being able to set the company vision and get everyone excited about that vision. Number two is getting the money to make it possible to go after that vision. And then number three is getting the talent to go do it. And then Kind of related to those three, I also think there's a pace setting, speed setting element of a founder CEO, kind of also related to accountability. And if you are a second or third time person, the money and the recruiting of people is much easier. It's much easier. You can get much better people and you can raise money so much faster. And when you see it working, much, much faster. And I think that's a huge advantage. Whereas the vision stuff, you learn and see things over time and that changes how you approach that. Speed stuff, maybe you just feel more comfortable doing what you want to do. You know, I think uh, advice I gotten from a friend of mine, Jim Payne, that he had, he was the CEO and founder of Mopub. He told me one of the best pieces of advice that he had gotten was like, just being reminded as a CEO, you can do whatever you want to do. At your company, you can do whatever you want. To a degree. And I think a reminder of that as CEO, you can really do what you want to do and do the boldest thing you want to do and go do it. And there's really nothing to stop you except your own fear. And I, oftentimes I think people forget that. I completely agree. I started this show almost three years ago and it was very tactical. In fact, it was for episodes one through 50, it was CROs. And what I wanted to do was put a spotlight on the people that I thought CEOs and founders, they always get these microphones, you know? And What I realized after that was like, actually, company building, there is so much advice on the tactics, but there is very little demystifying the fear and doubt and emotional aspects that come with company building. And so now you fast forward 100 episodes from then, and it's like, I wanted to talk to people that feel that the most. That tends to be founders and CEOs in most cases. But I think that there is this almost elephant in the room that I want to talk about on the show that most people don't, which is like, it's fucking scary. And the bigger your ambition, the harder it is to go achieve it. And I think along the way, a lot of the challenge is just like you in your own head asking yourself, can I do it? Because a lot of people believe in me to go do this thing. And I'm putting on a pretty brave face to do it. But can I do it? I don't know. Something I've changed that over time is I think that with my first company, Tap Commerce, I was very transparent about my concerns and fears and things like that with like a lot of people on the team. And I kind of pulled along everyone on the team on the roller coaster with me. 
And it probably wasn't for the best of the company. It led to a lot of disruption at the company because most people don't want that level of stress and ups and downs. And it was actually very selfish of me to kind of force upon other people the level of stress and problems that I saw. And I was pretty mindful of that with attentive that I didn't want to suck in the team into that roller coaster again and weigh it more on myself. I think I was just kind of able to go back to this idea with any particular risk or problem and say to myself, what am I really afraid of? What's the worst case outcome here? What does it look like if fears are hit and this is the worst case outcome? And the reality is that the worst case outcome is not that bad for, for all these situations. So I think if you can just remind yourself what that worst case outcome looks like. I was saying to a friend of mine the other day that the most nervous I get actually is I've given two best man speeches in my life at weddings. And that was actually the most nervous I've been in public speaking and stuff. And the reason why is you don't get a redo on that, <laughs> hopefully. So, you know, you have to give that speech one time. Everyone's going to see it and that's it. Whereas like for a company pitch to a, you know, a venture person or, or a sales pitch or whatever it is, like you're almost always going to get another shot at that and another riff to do it better and change it and whatever it is. There'll be other opportunities. And you just got to remind yourself of that. That for me has always helped eliminate the fear side of things. But the deep down fear underneath all of that isn't the deep, deep down fear that the company is going to die. And therefore, Brian starting his first company at Tap Commerce that always told himself this story that he's going to be the tech entrepreneur that makes it. The company dies and then Brian dies. Yeah, no one, yeah, yeah, yeah. No one cares is what I've learned. Yeah. No one cares. I think people are way overly concerned sometimes about their reputation. And certainly reputation matters. You know, you want to be honest and have high integrity, that sort of thing. But People are totally fine with you not winning every time, A, and B, most people won't notice when you don't. They're going to keep track of the wins and they might not even remember the losses. So I was talking about the venture firm, Andrews and Hearts, the other day, and they were like, you know, didn't he have like a social network or something that he started? It's like, yeah, I think it was, was Ning and it raised all this money and then it like blew up or whatever it was. But like no one remembers that part. And, you know, Mark Andrews is not talking about that or tweeting about that. Your losses are quickly forgotten. And I think people just need to remember that. Like losses can be very quickly forgotten. Is there something that you wish you could tell 29-year-old Brian? Yeah, I mean, I think that being more focused on hiring great people across entrepreneurship has been the best thing that's changed over time. I think that 29-year-old Brian probably tried to do a tremendous amount of things on his own. And I think instead, just putting more time and weight behind how much time you spend hiring is just incredibly essential. I think if you look back and you ask a lot of CEOs, oh, what do you, what do you spend your time doing? Oh, and recruiting. But if they actually look at their time, they don't spend enough time doing recruiting. And it really should be almost half your day. And if you look through your calendar, you're spending half your time doing recruiting. Because if you talk to a lot more people and you build a much bigger funnel, you're going to hire much better candidates. I still think that we take far too many shortcuts on recruiting at most companies. Why? Because most people don't enjoy it. Most like technical founders, you mean? I think most founders, period. What is recruiting? Recruiting is sending out a lot of messages on LinkedIn or whatever, or meetups or whatever it is, any way you can to find great talent, engage them. And then it's doing a lot of those conversations, additional conversations to get someone down funnel. And then when someone's great, selling them to bring them on and get them to sign on, right? Because once you kind of reach the yes, then it flips and then it's you trying to sell them. One of my best decisions has been bringing on a head of recruiting extremely early, founding level early for companies to build and manage a really big hiring funnel. Because if you have a big funnel, you're just going to have better talent. One other thing just on this idea is that people change through the course of their career a lot and what they want in the role and all that sort of stuff. And I think that we, you don't want to take too many shortcuts to try to fit square pegs and round holes in recruiting, which I think is the other big thing you see is people just take a shortcut in recruiting. I think a great question to ask is how many people did you interview for a given role? And often, you know, the answer would be, oh, two people, three people or whatever it is, right? Why do you only talk to three people for this given role? 
you know, did you already have one person you were decided on? It's really just, I mean, it does come down to laziness at a point, but maybe it's not just laziness. It's people don't like it. Interviewing, it's a tough thing to do. It feels unnatural. It is repetitive. It's draining for a lot of people to spend their days interviewing. So I think it's a tough thing for people to do. You have said that you have a unique view of how culture can impact recruiting, positive and negative. Specifically, what you said was that you think that it is a good thing if your culture turns some people off or if your culture actually makes recruiting more difficult. Can you explain that? Look, yeah, I mean, if you look at like the posted culture of values for a lot of companies, they all sort of mesh into the same thing, right? And if your culture isn't more wearing on your sleeve what you actually do and what you believe in, then you're no different than everyone else. You're just kind of saying the same stuff. So I think you have to be real about what defines your own company's culture. Otherwise, you end up hiring people that don't know that's the culture. And then surprise, surprise, they're unhappy or they're not a fit because you weren't upfront with them. Most people that don't work out at a company, it's the hiring manager in the company's fault. It's not the individual's fault because you hired someone that is not a fit with the company. That's not their fault. They're who they are, right? Unless they were very purposely masquerading to be something else to get in the process, but that's almost no one, right? In most cases, it's the company's fault. When you left, which is not long ago, attentive, how many employees? There's around 1,000 employees. 1,000. How many of the early employees became executives at the company? How many did you hire as executives? Did you think about this process? Were you intentional about it? How did you evaluate it? I was very lucky because, again, to my point around second time around entrepreneur, I was able to go get a handful of people that I thought were the best performing people that I had seen over the last four years at Twitter and Tap Commerce and also just kind of in the broader ecosystem and say, hey, we're doing this new thing. I think you're really awesome. Come join. And yeah, we ended up hiring an incredible group of people that you know held executive roles in some cases for five years, in some cases are still there running teams of four, 600 people and joined us from the get-go or within the first six, six months to a year. How many people did you have when you pivoted into what is now attentive? We had about 10 people. So not a tiny team. No, I think it was like 10 or 12 people. With a recruiter. Yeah, yeah. It was like 10 or 12 people. And because there were some people that were very specific to the first company, we parted ways with those people also to bring down burn a little bit and so that we could focus money on the new area we wanted to go after. Going back to our earlier conversation of different proxies for what product market fit was, when was that moment for you? And maybe, actually, can I back up a second? Why did you pivot? We pivoted for a few reasons. One was our customer's willingness to pay was not what we had thought it was. (laughs) So I think we made some classic mistakes in our exploration around looking for new customers. and. If you want to read about this at length, it's in my book that just came out called Problem Hunting. The first few chapters talk about this a lot. So if you want to dig in here, check out the book Problem Hunting. But the takeaway is that we had talked to a bunch of customers, a couple dozen, and we had thought that they had this big burning problem where they wanted a better way to communicate with their distributed workforce, non-desk workers like a manufacturing facility. So we built this software to help them communicate with their big distributed workforce. And we went out to try to sell that to those people. And when we did that, we found that they either didn't want to buy it or the amount they were willing to pay for it was not enough money that it would meet our goals for a high growth company. And, you know, we had customers saying yes. We had a a big brand that agreed to spend a a decent amount of money and wanted to sign on to the product. And we went through legal with them. We're about to sign. What's a decent amount? It was in the hundreds of thousands. Okay. For and, a tiny startup, is a lot. Yeah. And for software, yeah. I distinctly remember this because we got back to Redline and it was totally fine. And we were at this point where we could sign it. And I knew that if I signed it, we would be committed to this company because we'd have to go build the product to work for this big brand. And we'd probably get some other big brands to go do it. And it would be a business. But 
the trajectory growth on this business would not meet the hurdle we had for ourselves to build a high growth tech business. So it was tough because we saw that, but at the same time, we had gotten feedback from customers that, hey, there's another angle you could go in building tech software to communicate with potential and current customers instead of employees. After talking to a bunch of customers there, we felt like, hey, that was a much bigger TAM, much more fast growing and interesting market. Let's go do that. It was funny because I, I recall I had called up the big Fortune 500 brand and said, hey, you know, we're actually not going to do this company. <laughs> you know, we're, so thanks for going through the legal, doing all this stuff. If you want to try the new thing, we'll give you a free year of the, new, the, the other new thing we're doing. But like, we're not going to do the thing we, we sold you. And I remember he was just very confused because why would someone walk away? <laughs> like, isn't this the, he was like, isn't this the startup dream that, you know, you're about to get, and this is a very well-known brand. And they're like, you're about to get us spending all this money with you to do this. Isn't this like the dream that you want? And I'm like, yeah, but we just looked at it and it's like not going to grow at the speed we wanted it to grow at. And I, we easily could have got sucked into that. So that was very lucky. You do talk about it in the book. The book is excellent. It is the same publisher as Slootman's book, Amp It Up. I think this is in the book, but I've been so deep in Brian Long that I can't tell the difference anymore. But was it in the book when you started talking about how when Attentive started working, some people started leaving? Yeah. I don't know if it's in the book, but it did happen. So I guess a few things. One, you had asked an earlier question of when we knew we had product market fit. Yes. And I, I will tell you a very concrete answer to that question. Uh -huh. We knew that it solved the problem. So the problem was... I don't have a good way to get in touch with my customers. We turned our first program on for our first customer, and we did not know, will people sign up to get text messages? And when we send text messages, will they click on the messages? And will they go and buy stuff? And we turned it on the first day, 250 people signed up. We sent a text message. About 30-something percent of them clicked on it, and a bunch of them bought something. And that sending that text message costs like, a couple dollars and we made all this money for them and we said holy crap that really works so we knew that we had something that worked the problem was that no one wanted to buy text message you know everyone wanted mobile apps at the time no one really wanted to do text messaging but they all wanted to make more money they all wanted ways to get in touch with their customer so that ended up just being a go-to-market challenge which was instead of selling text messaging for the first year or two we never sold text messaging we just sold, hey, do you want a new channel that'll drive 20% more revenue? And the answer was yes. What are you talking about? And you say, oh, okay. And by the way, all these other brands are doing it. Oh, okay. What is it? And you're like, oh, it's text messaging. And then they're like, oh, okay. Like, I'll try it out for free. Sure. And that's really what drove our growth for the first couple of years. In terms of the question around people leaving, there were some situations where we had someone who was great and we had worked with on our prior company. And then we started this new company. And then they also had their first child. And after having their first child, they were just like, you know what? I'm just not really interested in working much anymore. <laughs> and we said, okay, that makes sense. Like, we understand. Like, thanks a lot for your help. And they left. When they left and, you know, a couple other people sort of shifted at that time too. You know, it was funny because we were on the eve of something big. But even at that time, you know, we were probably only doing 25, 30 grand a month in revenue. It was not a big revenue business. But if you looked at the underlying customer cube and you looked at the metrics on the business, every customer was spending more money every month. And we were adding new customers really fast. And every month we were adding more customers than we did the prior month. So even though the total dollar numbers were not that big, when you looked at the way the business worked and you had some vision for where it could go, you're like, oh, this could be very, very big. Even though initially the numbers were not blowing your eyes away in terms of this total top line. The book talks a lot about your deliberate effort to get, it's almost like reverse selling, get customers to say no to you so that you can really narrow in on the right thing. And there was this feeling of practicality that I found myself walking away with, not dissimilar from how to win friends and influence people. Yeah, I, I'm definitely very inspired by that. Like not dissimilar. I love startup books. They're very entertaining. They're great to read at the beach. I've read most of them. You read them and then you throw them away. You don't read them again. And I'm not sure how much it was really helping the one or one startup audience. Like it's entertaining, which maybe is good for selling books, but it's not really helping the person go do 
the job of starting a tech company. So this book, Problem Hunting, is like super practical, tactical. It's not entertaining. <laughs> we try to make it a little bit. When, when I say it's not entertaining, people are like, way to sell it, Brian. But like, it really is more supposed to give uber practical advice on how to do it. And you're right in that the approach of the book really does mirror a lot of elements of how to win friends and influence people in that I try to break it down into very clear guidance on the way that I would do things for particular parts of management of the company. What are some of your favorite interview questions? I think understanding someone's core motivation, where they're at in their life, and what they really want to do is very helpful to me to just kind of understand what that person's about, what they're driving towards. And there's a few answers that I get. One is you'll hear the honest answer of, I don't really know. I'm just getting started or you know, a couple years of my career, whatever, and I'm still figuring it out. And that's a totally great answer. There's people who are like, I want to be an entrepreneurship. I want to do startups and I love this. And I think if they say that, then you want to press a little bit and say, okay, what have you done so far to show me that you have those interests and that, you know, that's really how you feel and see some follow-up stuff. And then there's been cases where people give an answer that's, you know, not related at all to the role. And then I'm like, why do you think this job in any way will help achieve your goal? Like I interviewed someone a week ago where I said, what do you want to do? And the person says, well, I really want to be a therapist. And they're, they're interviewing for like an entrepreneurship type job, a startup. And I'm like, well, you know, then why are you talking to me? And they're like, well, you know, I'm told that you can't become a therapist until you're in your mid 30s because people don't want to take advice from 20 somethings. So I'm like doing other stuff until I get to my mid 30s. And I'm like, I appreciate your honesty. But at the same time, like, my goal is to help people who are interested in this so that their career. And everything gets bigger around it and they're motivated around that and I can help them do that. Like, I'm not going to help you become a great therapist. So, like, probably not a great fit. And sorry, just so I understand, what are you interviewing for today? We have a holding company called Lunar where we're building new companies out of. And right now we're working on one of those companies doing like a, a zero to one new company. And how many companies are you doing concurrently out of Lunar? In a given year, it might just be one company. And how involved are you? Um, CEO and founder of that company. Of Lunar. I'm partner at Lunar, but of the spin-out company, I'm a CEO and founder. Okay. And this is your first company? Well, this will be my third company. Well, this but, is Lunar's but first out of company. Lunar, yes, that's right. And what happens when the second Lunar, are you going to stay the CEO of this company? I will stay the CEO of this company in terms of what executive role I'll play in other future companies. I don't know. But for now- This is the company. For now, I'm focused on making this company great. But I do think that kind of in line with the book, problem hunting. I love spending the majority of my time going zero to one and building a great company. But I also do like spending time helping other people to start companies and helping them figure out some of that stuff. So I love that aspect of being able to do that at Lunar too. Why even do the holding company? Why not just do without the holding company? I think that you get a lot of additional leverage by being able to get more information, learn more stuff, be able to see other things that are going on. Yeah. It kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier around discovery process on businesses and this mindset that you are kind of forced to commit to something before you want to be committed to it. I think that's a little broken. And I think it's better to be able to have that flexibility to do deep discovery. So we've been able to talk to hundreds and hundreds of experts in a number of areas we were interested in and then find an area that we were most interested in, start a company in that. But now still have a great team of people talking and looking in other industries, and maybe we can help start another company in the coming years in another place and then another place after that and so on and so forth. I mean, it's hard not to be inspired by the likes of, you know, Elon and Sam and other people today who have been able to start and get many things going. And I think also sometimes it adds clarity when you're seeing other businesses. It, it helps you to not kind of live in an echo chamber of just the one company that you're executing. And have you, don't tell me yet, but have you narrowed in on what the company is? Yes, we have. And is this your moonshot company? I think that they're, uh, I think- Do you know who Peter Reinhardt is? Segments founder? Yes, I do. I know Peter, yeah. It kind of reminds me, again, we're about to find out. I don't know what your company does yet, but like sold segment, 
a couple billion dollars to Twilio. And now he's like built Charm Industrial, which is unfucking the world. You know, is this your unfucking the world project? It's not carbon capture. I'll tell you that much. But I think that for us, you have to find the cross section of something where you say, do we think this will have a really big positive impact and be great for a lot of people, A, but also B, is it something where I have a right to win, where I have a right to be great in? And I think finding that cross-section is really important for companies that you're going after. But yeah, I think what we're going after on the one hand is a very big and interesting area and market that I think will change the world, but also B, is something that I think we are very well positioned to execute in. Can you give us a sneak peek here? No peeks today. No peeks today. If you read the book, there's a part in the book that says, don't go social. What I mean by that is that I think sometimes people, you know, they start putting stuff on LinkedIn, telling their family, telling their friends, telling everyone, hey, this is what my company does. And then they realize a couple months later, oh, wait, this doesn't actually work or, hey, I want to change this or whatever. But they feel like they can't because it's going to hurt them reputationally. They'll look like a failure, blah, 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 because they told everyone what they were doing and now they're doing something else. And I made this mistake early in my career where I remember for my first company, we were doing something and I like posted it on LinkedIn, said what we're doing, told all these people what we're doing. We realized a few months in that that thing was not that good. But now I had to like backpedal and re-explain it to everyone and tell my mom, that's not what I'm doing. I'm doing something else now. And you just kind of feel like a fool doing that. And it kind of pulls you into keeping and doing that. I think not going social until you feel you've actually got to that sort of product market fit moment is better. That's actually really good advice. By the way, speaking of Peter at Charm, they don't even announce funding rounds. They literally, they have taken it to the logical extreme. Yeah, I mean, when you ask why you're doing a lot of things, I know, <laughs> I won't say his name, but I know a, a very polarizing entrepreneur who I think is one of the best entrepreneurs of our generation. And he was saying with his new companies, they have policies, no one can post on LinkedIn that they work there. No one will can say what they're doing here and, and they don't talk to any press or renounce anything. And the mindset is like, well, what are we going to get? What's the benefit from doing it? And I think that when you ask that question, oftentimes the answer is you're kind of doing it for your own ego. You just don't need to do that stuff. Like there's no reason to do a lot of it. So you really have to ask that question. And sometimes, look, sometimes there is a benefit. There's a reason to do it. In the case of funding rounds, maybe at one time there was a time when you could say, hey, big funding rounds will be a signal for other people not to invest. But these days with so much money in the market, it probably hurts you more because it just tells everyone else, hey, I'm going to go fast follow that shit. There are companies too that need the public press and PR, they think that's like kind of part of what makes them successful. Consumer-based companies, for instance, may benefit from that, right? But if you're like doing a B2B product that's operating behind the scenes or something like that, why would you want any press? Why would you want anyone to know what you're doing? Especially if it's something that in any way, as it gets really big, is potentially going to have backlashes and you know right. negative sentiment for angles of it and whatever. You have to recognize that for those companies. It's risk. Yeah, so you need to ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? Well, let me ask you this. Let's just take this podcast, for example. Would you have done this running attentive? Yes. I would have done it running attentive. For my first company, Tap Commerce, we had the company for a while, for like six, nine months. We tried to figure out something for the business. We pivoted like four times. We finally got something that worked. It worked for like four or five months quietly. And then after five months, I was convinced by someone that I should do a press release around our Series A and you know how the company was doing. The minute we did the press release, you know, within a month or two, we had like five copycat companies. And it was all right, but it was pretty annoying how quickly companies, literally their websites and their sales decks and things were just copies of ours. And... I wanted to avoid that with Attentive for as long as possible. So we kept it a lot quieter with Attentive and we kind of purposefully did not seek out any press. And I also just had a general view that almost all press was negative and like just didn't, didn't want to go there. Which is warranted. Which is true. You don't get Pulitzers for writing puff pieces. <laughs> so, so you're um, avoiding all of that stuff. And we probably did that for too long to the point that like, we go to many a conference and things and I'd meet people and no one would have any idea what my company was. 
And it was probably to the detriment of the company at a point because there was a point we reached, you're trying to sell to some mega C-level exec, eight-figure, approaching nine-figure deal, and he like hasn't heard of your company. That's not good. And that's where like our marketing team would be like, dude, you know, you should do those podcasts. That's what those C-level executives listen to. So you got to do that. But we didn't for a long time. And by the way, when we did finally start doing this stuff, like a few years in, we immediately had several copycat companies. It's just like increasing your risk surface area. Yeah, it does. And you're like, well, why are we doing this? We're selling B2B software. So it's like the consumers don't care about that. So who's listening? Competitors? Yeah. Well, so I'm smiling because the one thought that I had, and and that'll let you go, is, um, oh, it'll help with recruiting and talent. Like hearing people say that. But what's funny. Wrong type of talent. Maybe. I'll give you an example. Let's make a bet right now. I have a feeling that some pretty high quality people will listen to this and have no idea what it is that you're working on next and reach out to you and want to engage, want to work with you. Now, maybe you don't need that. Maybe that's negative signal. But the funny thing is, I was asking about attentives early days. And if I'm being intellectually honest, I don't think that I have Brian Long of Series A and B attentive when it was just getting off the ground on the show. You know what I mean? So you're you're a hundred percent. I think if I'm being honest with myself, I'm not even having you on the show at that point. There's two things there. One, I'm definitely not on the show at that point, but also two, Brian Long, that person is not even in this room. I think that you change tremendously, or at least I try to change tremendously over time to become a better leader and person in doing your job. And like, I think the person that I was in Series A and Series B is very different from the person today. I also do give a lot of credit to someone else you've had on the show, Matt Mochari, who was my executive coach for like three and a half, four years at Attentive. And, you know, I do think that the CEO job, it, it does change a bit, quite a bit. I felt like it was changing for me every six or nine months. And you kind of have to make that transition and change or you should find someone else. And he helped me tremendously in, I think, recognizing that and changing to change to the needs of the company. He's a gem. Dude, I appreciate you doing this. What are you excited about personally right now? Take away all this other stuff. What gets you going on the personal side? It's fun to be able to take people that you love and take people that you've worked around and like be able to go after more new, exciting things together and sort of feel like you can accomplish a lot more together for people that you feel like you owe a lot to for how much they've worked with you and help make each other successful. But you know, really, I've just been super, super lucky to work with incredible teams. And I think being able to help those people, help those teams build new things together is very, very exciting, A. And then B, you know, look, I'm, I'm also a, uh, I've got a two and a half year old and having kids amazing on the personal side. I've got an incredible wife who is the executive producer for the New York Times TV show. So she she does all sorts of Sick. amazing documentaries and things, which is uh, fantastic to watch. Uh, and that stuff's very, very fun to track and see and get exposure into how other industries and things are having a big impact, a positive impact on the world. Can we do a check-in in a couple of years once the cat's out of the bag and see how things are going? Yeah, you know, I hope to uh, reach the level where it warrants additional podcasts. That's right. Well, you might be too big league for me after this book sells out. You might not even want to be back on. You know, interesting thing on business book sales I've learned through this process is that typically they, or maybe this is just my publisher being nice to me, they say that typically, you know, you have a little bump when the book comes out. But then from there, it goes back down again. And then over the course of several years for business books is really where you'll see how that book shapes up. So if it's a true business book, and I'm not talking like something that is reaching consumers, you know, like it's not like Malcolm Gladwell or something, but like a more true like business book, a zero to one type of book will take years to really get into that true bestseller category. And he was saying to me that his favorite book that he produced is something that didn't make the New York Times bestseller list for four or five years. There's a lot of people who buy their way into the bestseller list. We didn't do that. So hopefully we'll, we'll get there in the future. Well, I'm hopeful that maybe this will help. Thank you for doing this. I close all these the same. When you hear the word grit, what do you think of? Putting one foot after the other every day. Brian Long, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. That's it. Thanks for tuning in. 
Feel free to come back every Monday morning to listen to a new guest or go back into the archives when we've done more than 100 episodes. This podcast is a Kleiner Perkins production and the episode was edited by Eric Johnson from Lightning Pod. Thank you all.